Lauren Bonn is a Los Angeles-based artist who conducts a large studio practice involving dozens of people in a warehouse in downtown Los Angeles. I said that Lauren's studio basically is about as large, her staff is almost as large as the museum's. And the studio tackles large problems. So they tackle things like how veterans are housed in, across America. And they tackle things like how Los Angeles gets its water. We had an extraordinary exhibition here uh, a few months ago uh, of their work um, there was just, just sort of one edge of this very complex social practice that Lauren uh, and her team conducted with a photographic team run by her husband, Rich, who's sitting next to her here in the second row. Um, some of you came and you saw those extraordinarily beautiful, strange photographs of the Owens Dry Lake that were actually made by the lake itself. These are wonderful photographs developed actually by burying them in the ground and letting the chemicals in the ground develop the, the photographs. Well, that was part of a large project that, and Lauren's a genius at this, that flipped the grand theft of water from the Owens Valley into a series of businesses through which people who live in the Owens Valley can have a productive life and an economy. It's, I, I use it when I talk about her work around the world, when I, when I give my lectures about the art of the Anthropocene, I use it as an example of the most complete and successful social practice of which I'm aware. Now, they've been working uh, with the Harrisons, Lauren's been meeting with him, I think, about once a month, actually, yeah, uh, for quite a while now. And, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing Newton and Helen Mayer Harrison because they are very well known. But I'll tell you a few things. They've been working for 40 years with biologists, ecologists, architects, urban planners, engineers, and other artists to initiate projects that support biodiversity and community development. And I'm quoting from the nomination language uh, that they are uh, have just been given by the uh, Buckminster Fuller Challenge Award. So they're one of the finalists for this award. I'm quoting the language from that. They are historians, diplomats, ecologists, investigators, there's that word again, emissaries, and art activists. Their work proposes solutions and involves not only public discussion, but extensive mapping and documentation of these proposals, first in an art context and then in the public realm. Look, these guys have been working all over the world. They get most famous Early on in the, in the 70s, they're teaching at, at UCSD, and they're, and they're working uh, on the lagoon, the La Jolla Lagoon, which is kind of dying. And they develop a way to help that lagoon come back to life. And they start working on lagoons around the world. Nowadays, they deal with things like the Tibetan Plateau. We started working on a project with them uh, several years ago in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that when I introduce their brown bag luncheon just before you all go upstairs. And Colin then gives you a more thorough, a thorough introduction about that. What I want to do right now uh, is bring Newton up first, who's going to talk for a little bit, then Helen's going to come up and read a text, then Lauren's going to come up and talk, and they're all going to convene on the couch and have a little conversation in front of us. It's not really a QA, it's for them to have a conversation to reveal their working practice. So, Newton, come on up, buddy. You need to get the slides so Wow, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it comes to pass. Lauren invites us out to Owens Valley, uh, uh, Lone Pine. So we're sitting around there, and everybody's telling Lauren, big project. And Helen and me, we're thinking, not such a big project. <laughs> so um, Lauren says, what do you mean not such a big pro project? So I said, well, you know, where are you? But it, the, and it was a new term for me, Intermountain West. And um, I sort of remembered her bringing the term up. She sort of remembered us bringing the term up first. So here's what it turned out to be. Well, to be blunt, we sat ourselves down and said, quote, let's take the fucker on. <laughs> so, so we did conversations back and forth, um, investigations back and forth, differences in persona, commonnesses in um, ethical concerns, that kind of stuff goes on. Well, that's the basis for, for forming a collaboration. What shows up here in, the, in this first draft, let me say, is uh, both similarity and difference. Um, where it's discovered that 750,000 square mile terrain has been violated in so many 
ways that parts must be abandoned. Thereafter, it's discovered, thank you, Laura, that with the boundaries removed, 1,330,000 square miles becomes a new frame for the Intermountain West, and a new country wants to happen. So who would have thunk it? Uh, certainly not in the beginning. So also shows up a kind of difference in the way we map, but not a difference in what we mean when we map. Um, for instance, there's the Intermountain West, um, um, our way of seeing with the Great Basin in it. Um, our map maker is here, is it? Well, okay. Um, and you can see it takes up almost a third of the country. No, maybe a fifth. That's a lot of country. Well, I'm not going to stay too long in this. Uh, so the first thing we do is we map all the cities. Mapping all the cities is really neat because it makes a kind of a drawing. And uh, we decide to stick to the states, to the, to the United States boundary, for at least this fragment of work. And that uh, sort of shows up that the Intermountain West has fewer people than most people than most places. It's a good idea that it has fewer people because it's the most violated place on the country. Um, we think, we'll get to it later, um, that things like this took it up. Look at it. Um, it's the most atom-bombed place in the country. The idea that we would be afraid of others and then bomb ourselves in, in response <laughs> is, is beyond belief. <laughs> Nobody need fear us. So, and uh, to follow through on this, in the Great Basin, what you're seeing here is arms reserves. We got enough armor in there to knock off the rest of the world the hell with atomic bombs. And so, this is a violated place. Now, uh, so there's the, there's the um, mapping of the influence of radiation. So with that in mind, wait a minute, we'll get one other thing up. Um, and you can see that, yes, radiation fades out, but something else happens. In some places, you're looking at 10 and 50 and 100,000 year negative impacts particularly in the center. And uh, again, when you look at that map, it's a relief that there are fewer people there. So what Helen and I have designed for ourselves and for Lauren is out of the, our, our force majeure works. And the force majeure works simply say, you know what? Tell me when I'm five minutes into this thing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm five minutes? Okay, I got three more minutes and I got to hop. Uh, but before I do that, Helen has to do a reading. So um, our force majeure work simply say, you know, our method of, of taking things from all systems weakens the systems. And we take but don't give back, whereas nature takes and gives, gives and takes. That's why nature gets stronger over time, and we will get and are getting weaker over time. Within that context, I'd like Helen to do a quick reading. It's reflecting on the laws of the conservation of energy and applying them to the exploitation we have of ecosystems. Matter en energy can be transformed from one form to another. Matter energy can be neither be created nor destroyed. When matter energy is transformed from one form to another, there is a net loss of available energy. This loss is called entropy. A system has been transformed and thus lost energy, moved towards higher entropy then. A system that has all its energies intact is a low en entropy ecosystem. If a forest uh, in a watershed is clear cut, all the energies in the wood are transformed and dispersed. 
the energies within the topsoil, that is the energies embedded in the earth dependent habitats, supporting a majority of multiplicity of lives are a consequence of erosion and are dispersed. The entropy of the watershed can be increased the, um, but by the reversal of these energies. Since the energies so dispersed cannot be retrieved, what then, watershed? What then can we do? And And that's a mini description of this place. Um, so this is all the watersheds of the, oh, this is all the rivers of the country exaggerated. Fewer there than elsewhere. This is um, a quick and dirty map of um, all the aquifers in the country uh, when they were healthy before drawdown. This is a map of our present aquifers after drawdown. You can see entropy built into the system simply by suction. <laughs> this, is, um, this is a heat map. It's uh, what will happen in the country maybe 80 years from now. Um, the, the hottest part is guess what? Our uh, our place, our little place. Look, when it heats up like that, this, is, this would be the farming that exists there. When it heats up, it gets cut in half to less. That's the grasslands that exist there. A lot of cattle. When it heats up, you lose about 60, 70%. What will they graze on? The forests that are there. When it heats up, you get maybe a 70% loss and a 70% species loss. Therefore, our proposal, seen simply, is time to abandon this place. <laughs> yeah, it's time to abandon this place. And then, let's set in place a rehabbing of that place, where slowly, by teams, um, um, you make a... Um, a, a corridor from Canada to Mexico and bring life back there. So we took a look at the map of it from a point of view of who owns what. The Bureau of Land Management and all government entities own much of it. That is, we the people move uh, own it. And so we the people can sort of tell them what to do if we, if we have the courage to so do. It's, in what, it's within this context, I'd like Lauren to come up here because um, she had a way of mapping, which we copied here as a sort of thank you. And if you look, there's the Intermountain West, and there's a large white shape there, which she will begin to talk about. Where it's discovered that a different form of mapping better carries the idea of a country wanting to form and becomes the basis for a first dialogue addressing such an event. We who aspire toward a nation that protects living things find it difficult to escape the irresponsible actions that have rendered vast territories of our continent unusable. The cost of living in the most violent empire in history is the cost we now assume in addressing the rebalance of catabolic descent. We hereby proclaim an independent nation, a nation formed to support the human species, the pollinators, the remaining wild equine, the fish and soaring birds. We name our new country Rose. Rose is a coalition of watersheds. It includes the Colorado River watershed, 
the Columbia River watershed, the Great Basin, the Gulf of Mexico seaboard, the Pacific Ocean seaboard, and the Rio Grande. Here's our uh, analytical map of our inheritance of the as-built of the North American continent with the major waters of, uh, water bodies and the major tributaries that fall from there. Here's a contour map of uh, the North American continent, and you can see the um, as-built of the mountain ranges um, as dark black lines and the deserts in white. Uh, the sea, of course, is also white as the lowest, uh, lowest contours. You can see the Great Basin and the Sierra. Um, you can see the Central Valley of, of California. And what's tinted pink is the beginnings of the footprint of the Nation of Rose. The coalition of watersheds, as Newton and Helen have uh, already explained, uh, has the least uh, presence of human impact uh, and the most presence of the um, violence exacted in the North American continent. The orange um, dots here are um, uranium mines that are mostly um, concentrated around the Colorado River, which was the river that John Wellesley Powell is um, so well known for exploring. Um, and John uh, Wellesley Powell is also the explorer who the United States um, commissioned many explorations ac across what was known as the arid lands. And he came back with a very sensible um, way of looking at habitation of the arid lands, which was that we should live within the um, concept of the, the drainage basin, that the Intermountain West was largely um, geographically about ridges and basins, and all of those basins contain the remainder of the two great ancient lakes, Bonneville and Lahontan. So while the land is arid, the basins are actually full of water, and any settlement could survive if we learned basin by basin how to govern ourselves. So his proposition um, in the 1870s and the 1880s, um, when the United States was looking to acquire the arid lands, was that we think not about land acquisition, but we think instead about um, think of, of water basin um, government. So the coalition of Rose, the uh, country that we propose forming um, so that we can allow ent entropy rebalance to occur is in, in many ways part of this uh, um, re-looking at the Powell map um, to, to uh, use some animation to explain the um, hydrology of the area. I used um, a legal format called a convention. The UN allows uh, conventions to be read which allow for the redefinition of country or continent. Gandhi, for example, wrote a convention that he delivered at the UN on human rights. Uh, this, what I'll read with um, this animation of the hydraulics of Los Angeles and its relationship to the Intermountain West is a convention on the elimination of all forms of aggression on the, watership, on the watersheds of roads. We define ourselves as a nation for the purpose of a common language. Natio, or the place that we're born, is a term which unites us rather than separates us in the way prior national boundaries have often done so. We do so with the single purpose of healing and supporting the watersheds of our common asset, the peaks and valleys of the Intermountain West and forming this coalition to speak for all those living beings who cannot speak for themselves, the vanishing wild animal kingdom that still survives in Rose Cow or the Coalition of Watersheds. Convinced that the establishment of Rose will protect the well-being of the four adjacent watersheds, the Columbia, the Colorado, the Rio Grande, and the Great Basin, and taking into account that Rose's territories are within the footprint of the Intermountain West, 
Like rivers, our nation's boundary aspires toward the shoreline. Part two, bearing in mind that whenever possible, we, the citizens of Rose, will not tolerate any aggression towards our watersheds, including, but not limited to, exploitive mining operations, energy grids that compromise life forms, toxic residue burials, desecration of sacred spaces, outmoded short-term gains to support mega developments in outside watersheds. Part three, emphasizing that parts of the Great Basin, Columbia and Colorado watersheds are highly damaged by uranium mines, nuclear test sites, and plutonium production. In addition, the Columbia River and Colorado River and Rio Grande are polluted by agricultural runoff, human waste, and industrial pollutants such as arsenic, dioxin, and PCBs. The Colorado River, Colorado, Columbia River, and Rio Grande are heavily dammed to provide power for major cities and water for agriculture drastically changes the river's ecosystems and jeopardizes the survival of native and anadromous fish populations. Part four, aware that the snowpack of the Sierra Nevadas, the Rocky Mountains, and the Cascade Range has been fully allocated for human use, leaving very little water for ecosystem functions. The current economic growth model is incongruent with the physical reality of water availability in the watersheds of Rose. Bearing in mind that global warming is threatening the coastlines on both sides of the continent and will likely have a destabilizing effect on climate throughout the world, the country of Rose is formed to face the challenges of adaptation to, to new climatic conditions and the goal of preserving life for all living beings. Affirming that Rose accepts responsibility for the glacial time rebound of our common watershed, together we organize ourselves around tending to this long-term patient waiting rather than exploiting her natural assets for short-term gains. So we are issuing a new passport to the country of Rose or the Coalition of Watersheds and um, you can become a dual citizen of Rose. Um, to apply you can just go to the Metabolic Studio website and um, become part of our database. This is of course part of the Metabolic Studio's belief that artist-led action is a true um, remaining liberty of the American system. Um, you know, we acknowledge that there are very few countries in the world where you could have an art conference and feel fairly secure in uh, criticizing the stewardship that your country has given um, the world and, and declare uh, as an art action a new nation. Um, so in a way, uh, applying for this passport is protecting your civil liberties and it's a way that we as artists can um, reclaim the stewardship of being the avant-garde is to form movements which in and of themselves leverage uh, political ethics into um, the conversation. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up to my colleagues, um, my esteemed colleagues, Helen and Newton, for a five-minute conversation together on our work. Rich Nielsen is a master printer in Los Angeles who's worked with many of the best artists on the West Coast and around the country. Um, and he has produced the passport, which is a beautiful object. And uh, I was a proud recipient of a gifted passport this morning as one of the uh, charter citizens of Rose. And I encourage you to go to the website and join the country. Um, you guys are going to have a brief conversation about your working practice. And then we're going to ask uh, Ed and Susanna to come up and join you after a few minutes, Susanna, to join you uh, for about a, just a, sh a short question about teamwork. And maybe if we have time, we'll have a question and answer session, but we'll see. Well, I have one thing. It's a relief to find a collaborator. Helen and I were getting lonely. <laughs> uh, um, you ask yourselves, how many people are actually working at scale? By I mean, like, say, there's, four million, there's two million square kilometers viable on the Tibetan Plateau. We're actually doing stuff there. Um, we have to deal at that level and literally deal with them. Um, on our, when we'll talk at the bag lunch and we, we brought a pamphlet on the forts majeure which we'll give out, we've got a hundred of them um, for people who want. And so what Lauren has done 
and what we've done, but it's kind of interesting. There are places in the world you got to abandon. And there are places, there are countries in the world that need to break apart and reform. And therefore, I would make an argument that we found our way into two of the things that better happen. Uh, one is to let large places go fallow and help them revive. That is to say, drop the entropy in, in places that have been violated. And the other is our present country systems is, don't work. And that's what Lauren should add to. About, about this time last year, I had the privilege of undertaking a survey of the LA Aqueduct with 100 mules and a team of wranglers. And what started as a metaphor became um, a very real understanding about the uh, professional practice that is still alive and well in the inner mountain west of people who understand the landscape through their work on mules and horses. And being out there, I, I realized that these surveys that were undertaken um, in the 19th century were so full of wisdom and that our contemporary practice uh, is, is also so full of the poetics of explaining those things that a kind of hybrid engagement occurred where Helen in particular, uh, who's so gifted at creating space in our, um, in our imagination for uh, seeing these voids of the Great Basin and filling it with uh, the emotional quality of adventure. Um, it seems you know, that she, she has this unique ability to, to be that translator between the real exploration that I was allowed to take last year that has really galvanized my understanding that it is time to form a new country to allow per perhaps the last best hope on the North American continent to survive versus her ability to say that country actually comes from those spaces that we as an audience fill with our love of them. The empathy, the empathy issue, issue. For, a, uh, issue for a second. It works. Mm -hmm. Hello. What they're talking about uh, there is empathy. That is feeling for the land. And if we do not feel for the land, we can watch it be destroyed and turn our heads the other way. But we are now getting to be old enough to know better, to know that the land has more to offer us than we have to offer for the land. But we have to think, what can we offer to the land? What way can we care for it that will help the land and will help us? because anything that helps the land will help us. And thanks. <laughs> Please pay attention. Maybe there's a question out there. I ran out of answers. <laughs> sure. I just want to say one thing as you're listening to the, to the Harrisons and, and Lauren talk. Um, you keep hearing us, or keep hearing me, I guess, talk about the different books that we're publishing. And I just want to say that um, Helen and Newton have been working on for the last more than a year all of the backstories behind their projects and their 40-year practice. Um, that's been assembled into a 500-page-plus manuscript. It's been edited by our colleague David Abel, who is a research uh, fellow here at the Center for Art and Environment. He also edited the uh, Late Harvest Catalog. And that book um, will go into production sometime in the future. It's not the far off future. It's not the immediate future. It's somewhere in between. Near so, future. <laughs> Newton is definitely pushing for the near future. So I just want, to keep it, want you to keep in mind that that's another, yet another book project that we're working Very on. Very near future. <laughs> it could be there's a vested interest there. 